six, five, four, three. Tell her, Dent. If our Miss Ross isn't dashing about the countryside, passing on the good or bad news, why isn't she? Because whoever it is you wanted to talk to knows the news already, sir. We're at a guess. What is she meant to be telling to whom? She is meant to be telling someone that my good friend and teacher, Michael Andrew Donati, is known to me as a terrorist and a traitor. Good heavens, Paul. You don't really believe that, do you? I'm not maintaining that you are a traitor, Mike, not at all. Only that I've caused that girl to think so. That isn't how it sounded to me. It was a ploy, no more. Putting my head on the block. You have nothing to be alarmed about, Mike, really. Haven't I? You alarm me. What goes on in that devious mind of yours alarms me. Sally Ross is a great admirer of yours. She now believes you to be involved in some kind of conspiracy, and she ought to be doing something about it. What? Well, getting in touch with the real conspirators, telling them that I'm suspicious of you. Why should she? She may be perfectly happy for you to be precisely that. No, but she is an admirer of yours. If she thinks that I think you're involved, she should be doing something, anything, to get you out of trouble. Not if I am. She may know how deeply I'm involved and decide that it's cheaper to sacrifice me rather than to risk anybody else. That's assuming that you are involved. If you're not, she must surely see it as her duty to save you from me. You're being disingenuous, Paul. Why was the door of my room unlocked? Why shouldn't it be? You're not a prisoner. Nothing that happens here is unintentional. I can only suppose that you intended me to be at liberty to go where I wanted. That it didn't matter to you whether I overheard your conversation just now or not. Maybe. I've become a pawn in whatever game you're playing, haven't I? Just because one of my students has got caught up in a revolutionary movement, I no longer matter. I can be used as part of an elaborate machine to attract them. Why your students, Mike? Why always your students? Always? This is the first time that I'm well, for aware... for a few years anyway, but five or six years ago? Fifteen years ago, my most troublesome student was called Frederick. Resolve the conundrum for me, Mike, regardless of whether you like being used or not. Assuming that that girl believes you to be in some sort of danger and she's at liberty to do something about it, why isn't she? Because your basic premise is wrong. Oh, no, it's not Mike, no. As far as that girl is concerned, you are in danger. But, Paul, you are working on the assumption that she is involved. She may not be... I know she is. All right. Because she doesn't care about me. Because she has to protect her associates, whatever happens. Because she doesn't have to do anything. Somebody else is going to do it for her. Because she has done something already. I don't know, Paul. In any hypothesis, as undefined as this, there must be at least ten answers. It's not that undefined. Thank you, anyway. Perhaps you'd care to return to your room until it's time for us to go home to dinner. In the circumstances, I don't think I should come home with you. Don't take your dislike of of what I have to do out on Jane. She is expecting and looking forward to your visit. You may use our dinner party as another weapon in your armory. I may. I shan't, though. I give you my word on that. Um, that understanding... Don't be too disapproving, Mike. After all, you taught me my regard for law and order. And justice. All I am trying to do is preserve the law and keep order without hurting anyone too much and without anyone hurting him or herself. And will the door of my room be open or closed this time? Mr. Dent? There isn't a lock on the door of your room, Professor. Send up Chief Inspector Sandman and Detective Sergeant Cole, please. All right, gentlemen, sit down, help yourselves. Miss Ross must have done something, Mr. Sandman, as at this moment she refuses to do anything. Now, look, let's go over it again. She left my London office and went home to Stackpool. No contacts on the way? No, sir. She later visited the home of Robert Sadler. No contacts made? None at all, sir. You're sure? Absolutely, sir. Then what? 
Well, as she'd broken the curfew, I entered the house and took her into custody. And at that time, she was alone with Mr. Sadler? Well, apart from myself and Sergeant Evans, yes, sir. Yes, of course, Mr. Salmon. And after you arrested her? She accompanied me to the police station, where she pleaded guilty to Section 3B. She elected not to go for trial, but to pay the statutory fine, which in this case was the minimum, her source of income being limited to her student salary, and this being the first offence in her current passbook. She was warned not to repeat the offence, and then accompanied home. Cole? Well, she was observed getting up at half past six the next morning, sir. Left her apartment at seven the moment the curfew was lifted. She stopped at a corner shop to buy a morning paper and the permitted quantity of MJ-8 with some herbal tobacco. Did anyone go into the shop with her? Uh, no, sir. The proprietor and his wife have been questioned and they seem to be okay, sir. Where are they? Still being held, sir. Do we know anything? Nothing at all, sir. The man's a war veteran, a member of the ex-service man's loyalist league. That could be a cover, of course. Go on, go. Well, she then went straight into the church. The church? The church at the conversion, sir. She's registered there. I followed her into the church. She spent a certain amount of time in prayer, but not that close to any of the other worshippers that she could have been either speaking to them or passing a note. After a while, she went into confession. The name of the priest? Uh, Father Conrad. Well, how long Miss Ross has been deeply religious? Well, she was in confession for a few minutes and came out, said a prayer, left the church. I followed her out, and by that time we'd received a message over the radio that you wanted her brought in, so she was detained immediately and brought here. So, if she made contact with anyone, it was with Mr. Sadler, or the proprietor of the shop at which she bought her paper, or the priest. What do you know about the priest? Oh, nothing at all, sir. And Mr. Sadler, the boy's father? Never stirred from the house until the car picked him up in the morning, sir. Now, it has to be the man in the shop, or the priest. Mr. Salmon. Sir? Seal off the church. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? Or figs of What are you doing here? What's going on? Don't let us disturb you, Father. Carry on with your service. What do you want? Take no notice of us. Just so long as nobody leaves the church. I don't know why I've got to see him again today. He never does me any good, except for those pills he gives me. You won't get better, dear, if you don't want to get better. I won't get better, period. Why pretend? I said, why pretend? There's lots of people lead busier lives than you. In fact, do a job of work. I wish I could. What are you doing? Finishing some work for the printers. Why now? Why can't you talk to me? I want to get it finished before the doctor comes. What do you know of the community of the conversion debt? Not much, sir. It's a small church, about five priests, perhaps half a dozen lay brothers. A branch of the London Order, which is much bigger. The London lot run a printing press, under license, of course. Print mostly religious tracts, pamphlets, posters. The kind of thing young people like to stick to their walls. Five priests in Stackpole? About. Miss Ross claims she didn't know the identity of the priest who heard a confession this morning. I'd say that was hardly likely. Be able to bring this little matter to a swift conclusion in that case, sir, wouldn't you say? Are you in charge of this? Is this your doing? Father Pryor? Yes. My name is Frederick. I'm very sorry about this. It all happened quite without warning, I'm afraid. I came as soon as I had. Mr. Frederick, are you responsible for this? If not, will you take me to Would where you please it is? sit down, Father? It's an outrage, an absolute outrage. Would you please sit down, Father? Now, 
Would you tell me who was hearing confessions this morning between the eyes of Dent? Seven and about 8.30, sir. Why do you want to know? Wouldn't it be simpler if you told me? Under no circumstances are you to question any priest about his confessions. Do you understand that? He is not allowed to reveal anything about them. I only want to know who. Oh. This morning it would have been Father Conrad. And where is Father Conrad now? Well, still in the church where your men have been holding him for half an hour with many decent ordinary people. All right, I know. I'm sorry. The innocent always get involved in this kind of thing when you're dealing with... Well, when there's trouble, it's never only the troublemakers that get hurt. Father Conrad is not a troublemaker. He is a good priest. How long has he been here? About five or six years. Exactly. Exactly. I shall have to go and look at my records. I've no doubt he would tell you if you asked him. I shall. Dent, would you go with the father, please, and look at the records? What about Father Conrad, sir? Have him sent in here to me. Perhaps you can tell me the meaning of this. Father Conrad? Yes? Who are you? I want an exact account of every single person you've spoken to, every single one, since hearing confessions this morning. What right have you to ask? Would you just sit down and start, please? I'm not going to tell you. You are. First, I want the names of those who came to confession. You've no right to ask that. No right at all. I'm expressly forbidden to give such information. If you don't tell me, I shall find out. I shall go through the lists of all those registered at this church and I shall question every single one, if necessary, in detention. If you refuse to cooperate, many of your penitents may spend quite a long time in detention. That's the most terrible thing I've ever heard anybody say. Even if I were allowed to, I couldn't tell you. I don't know the names of half my penitents. I make no attempt to identify them when they're in a confessional and I put them straight out of my mind the moment I've heard their confession. If you concentrate, I think you'll find you're able to remember. Come in. Thank you. Now then, Father, while you're thinking over what you're going to tell me, you have a parishioner called Sally Ross, I believe. Do we? I was not aware of it. You have. She's registered at this church. If you wouldn't know, who would? The prior might. Get him, Dad. Why did you ask to come here? I didn't, and I'd be only too happy to be allowed From to From London leave. to this church. Why? Why? I know when. You came here almost five years ago, exactly. Why? Why not? I had to go somewhere. You could have stayed in London. London's turned into a kind of printing press. It's no longer a community. I wanted to work with people again. This seemed to offer the best chance of parish work. How many other churches does your order have throughout the country? One in Cheltenham, one in Brighton. One in Glasgow, one in Liverpool, one in the slums of Aberdeen, Newtown. Why not one of those rather than here? I didn't specify where I wanted to you go. You did, according to the prior. Ah, Father, solve a puzzle for us, will you? Father Conrad maintains that... No. Now, let me put it this way. When Father Conrad applied to join this community, did he specify this particular one or just any community anywhere as long as it was doing parish work? Well, then, I think he wanted to join this community. I think I so. I think so, too. One other thing. Sally Ross. Is she a member of this church? Yes, definitely so. Father Conrad... Father could've... Conrad didn't remember. How long has Miss Ross been a member of this church? About five years, I should say. Isn't that about right, Father? I don't think we should discuss our parishioners with these people, Father. I only want to know how long Miss Ross has been a member of this church, that is all. Father Conrad, I don't see the harm in telling him that. I don't wish to tell him anything. You've told me a great deal already. Thank you, Father. I shan't tell you anything more. Then I shall find out in my own way. You, sit down. Right. Oh, please sit down. Shut up! Well, I'd say that about does it, sir. Are you sure? Well, pretty well. I had plenty of time to study them while the girl was in confession. Good. Now, Chief Inspector, you know what I want. Those who went to confession and those who didn't. Those who didn't, when you're certain, get rid of them. Those who did, you go through them until you know what every one of them did the whole of the day. Know and can prove in a court of law if necessary. Hey, well, sir. It might take all night. If it takes all year, sir. Right. Thank you, Father. Don't leave the building without permission, will you?
Right, next one. Come in, sit down. It's Brother Martin Stewart, isn't it? Yes, sir. Sit down. Where were you this morning at half past seven? In church, sir. Did you see Father Conrad at any time whilst you were in the church? Yes, sir. He was here in confession. I saw him going in. Good. Did you see anyone go to confession? No, sir. I saw him go in and I was busy serving mass. I didn't see him again until after breakfast. You didn't? No, sir. Are you sure? Yes. I have a note here that you were serving breakfasts from eight till nine o'clock. Is that so? Yes. Did Father Conrad not have breakfast this morning? Oh, yes. Then you saw him in here at breakfast? Yes. Did he speak to anyone? Not at breakfast. Are you quite sure about that? Yes. When did you see Father Conrad next? In church. Yes. He came into the church while I was cleaning it. At what time was that? About ten. Did you see him do anything? He came in, said a few prayers, then left again. Did you see him speak to anyone? Just Father Easton. And then? Then they left together. And that was the last time you saw Father Conrad? Until this evening, yes. Thank you, Brother Martin. That will be all. Right, next. No, 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 no. Just hang on, Evans. I don't want to see anybody else just yet. Right, sir. Father William Easton, sir. Travels regularly between here and London, where he's involved in their printing works. Left this morning not long before lunch. The pass was obtained as one of a batch of eight Saturday Sunday passes he got at the same time. Thank you, Dad. How many more do we have to see? Three more lay brothers, sir. I don't think I'm going to bother. Will you see them yourself? Yes, sir. I think I have it now. I'm going to see the minister. And then I'm going home. Would you organise a car to pick up Professor Donati, please, and bring him to my flat? Do you want to hear if you get anything more here, sir? If you do? Yes, of course. Oh, don't. Do you have a word with Samuel? Tend to have Father Conrad placed under arrest. Let us pray also for our persecuted brethren in other lands, that they may be brought through their sufferings into the light of thy peace, O Lord. Amen. Come with me, please, sir. And what will happen to the sheep if the shepherd is struck down? Just a further questioning, sir. I know now, sir. Proving it may be difficult, but I do know. Proving it isn't necessary. Pull them all in and make sure none of them has a chance to cause trouble ever again. I wish it were that easy, sir. Make it easy. For God's sake, you're dealing with terrorists. What kind of proof do you need? If I pull in the ringleader now, sir, I may lose some of the strands that would lead me to other cells elsewhere in the country. Well, that shouldn't be a problem. Once you have them in prison, you're unusually hesitant, Frederick. I don't understand it. Not losing your grip, are you? No, sir. <laughs> do you remember Professor Donati? Donati again. He should have been taken out of circulation years ago. He will be soon enough. One of his pupils is the boy under sentence of death for the reservoir murder. Yes? The execution isn't due for another eight days, sir. I was wondering if you could bring it forward a little. Does it make any difference? It could. When? The day after tomorrow. Very well. And how will this help you? It might make Professor Donati feel a little more inclined to cooperate, sir. Do you need his cooperation? I'd have thought a confession was more in order. I know almost all of it now, sir. I know how Donati communicates with his group. I think I know how his group communicates with other groups throughout the country. I lack very little of the total picture. But if Donati believes he can still save that boy, he might just be inclined to tell me the rest. And what is the rest? Where he gets his information. Sally! I don't know why, Rob. He just said on Mr. Frederick's instructions. What 
What's he doing, Robert? What's it matter so long as he allows us to be together? It does matter. I've got the terrible feeling about that man that we're all just puppets to him. Whatever we do, even if it's just kissing, it's all part of some grand design of Frederick's. Let's kiss all the same. Some things can't help. Anything we say. Well, don't say anything. Just think. You can never reach inside our minds. Our thoughts can never be his. I've come to realize over the last two days that the safety we thought we had by only knowing a little bit, by not being able to tell anyone any more than our own small function, it's not safe at all. We can't protect the whole against someone who can see a different part from the one we know. Yeah, what's it matter now? Not even Frederick can penetrate the real heart. It's too big. What is going to happen to you? Well, we both know that by now. Is there any point in trying to stop it anymore? Look, I don't want to die, but I don't want to live the way I was living. When? I don't know. <laughs> they said ten days. I... I suppose it could be sooner. Live every moment as though it's your last and you lead a good life. Isn't that what we're taught? Robert, if what we know isn't important, then isn't it worth saving you no. by telling him? Isn't it worth the it? The moment you agree to their rules, then you agree to their way of life. Look what happened to me at the trial. The moment my lawyer agreed to let me plead, the trial virtually ended. I got caught up in their way of doing things and ended up by pleading guilty. If I'd refused, I'd... Please, Robert. Isn't it worth thinking about? <laughs> Why believe that Frederick would let me live anyway? Why trust because him? Because there's no alternative. No, Sally. You mustn't be afraid. Why has he done this? Let me see you now. To stretch our nerves. Alone, we can escape from the reality of what's happening by thinking about each other, extending compassion towards each other. Together, there is no escape. There is escape. No more talk of giving in to Frederick. No. Then we defeat him, even if we do what he wanted. We can still save the boy's life, Mike. You don't really have to do very much. I can't do anything except plead for him. I've given instructions that he's to spend the rest of his time with his girlfriend. He doesn't have very long now. The minister wants to get it over quickly before this time for him to become a martyr. When? The day after tomorrow, I fear. Look, Mike, let me tell you what I know so far. Then perhaps you'll realise it won't hurt if you tell me the rest. I know nothing. Do you want me to leave? No, no, I would rather you stayed. I want this to remain informal. The starting point is the girl. While you were having dinner with us here last night, she went to visit Robert Sadler's father. They talked of nothing else except you. Mr. Sadler was preparing a list of those who came to visit his son very often. I didn't. I never do visit my students. Why not, Mike? You used to. Because I bring trouble to them, as you see. On this occasion, it was the lack of visits that caused the trouble. Having emphasized to Mr. Sadler that your name must under no circumstances be mentioned in connection with Robert. A fruitless precaution, really, as you'd already gone into the witness box to speak on his behalf. As I would for any of my students, Paul. Even you. She wasn't totally surprised when I subsequently explained my interest in you to her. I wanted her to do something. She didn't have to do anything in particular. What interest in me? What could you tell her? It doesn't matter what. I told her, in fact, that I believed you to be deeply involved in the terrorist movement. I wanted her to rush out and contact someone. She didn't. She didn't do anything. That in itself told me a great deal. Didn't it occur to you that she might have done nothing because there was nothing for her to do? Yes, of course. In that case, she was providing some kind of confirmation that you weren't involved in the movement at all. I felt that to be inherently unlikely. The other much more reasonable explanation was that she didn't do anything then because she'd done something already. She'd anticipated me and made contact before I'd had her brought in. I'm surprised you allowed me to remain at liberty so long. When I later examined her actions, I found a very simple method of making contact. I'll come to that in a second. Look, first, let me explain what I think has been happening over the past few years. There were a small number of facts that didn't seem to have a connection. Now it's obvious. The first 
is your decision five years ago to give up your pass and therefore to stop seeing Jane and me. The second is that Robert Sadler started to go missing from his home just five years ago. He took two wandering off on his own for one or two nights. His father put this down to the emotional disturbance resulting from the death of his mother a year earlier. The other, much more reasonable explanation, is that at about the same time he had already fallen under your instruction and your influence and was probably recruited by you into the terrorist movement not long after you started teaching him. Why should my decision not to see you and Jane be connected with this movement? There's an old Russian proverb about wild geese not living in the same hut as the hunter. Yes, but why me? You I can understand, and so far as I can understand anything. He could hardly stop seeing me and go on seeing you. Next we come to the fact that Sally Ross became a practicing Christian just five years ago, at about the same time as uh, she first, indirectly through her boyfriend, came under your influence. Then I discovered that a certain Father Conrad, once again, just five years ago, asked to be transferred from the London headquarters of his order to a church in Stackpool, and that Sally Ross started visiting that same church shortly afterwards and confessing to that same Father Conrad, eventually this morning. Now, none of this is conclusive, Mike, but you do see where it's leading, don't you? No. I know how Father Conrad gets his information. I think I know how he passes it on. I know he went to Stackpool to be near you at about the same time that you first became deeply involved in the terrorist movement. It'll take me about a week to find out the rest. By that time, it will be too late for the boy. I do quite a lot to try to save Sadler's life. I think we need people like him. There aren't enough young men left who are prepared to act on a simple belief for what is right. But I can't help you. Because you are wrong. You may be right about the girl and the priest, I don't know. But I stopped seeing you and Jane, if you have to know. Because I found what you were doing was so appalling that I could no longer bear to see you. And I didn't want the expression on my face to tell Jane what I really thought about the man I had introduced her to. Now, Paul, I'll leave you. I don't know whether it is to go to prison or to go back home, but I'll take a chance on that. Not to prison, Mike. That would be too easy. You can go home and think it over. I'd like to help you this time, because I want to save that boy. I can't. I know nothing. Would you take Professor Donati home, please, then come back for me. Goodbye, Jane. I'm afraid this is the last time. I understand that. I'm sorry. Paul? I've given instructions that you are to be put through to me at any time of the night or day. Any time at all that you want to talk to me, Mike. Bye. I'm sorry, too. What's going to happen to him? Nothing, I hope, if he sees sense. Your sense. It's a sense I learned from him, darling. We both did. Oh, no. I think I learned something quite different. I'm not sure anymore what he taught you, but he taught me how to see... See straight? Oh, perhaps. You think I can't see things as they are anymore? I don't know. We obviously regard Michael in quite different ways. Why? Whose fault is that? Has he changed, or have we? You obviously think he has. Oh, I know he has. The man I once hero worshipped is now the leader of a terrorist organization trying to overthrow the state by the use of bombs, guns, murder, violence, intimidation. In your opinion? Oh, no. He is. You just have to accept that, darling. You're never wrong, are you? You know Michael's responsible for the wave of terrorism that's been sweeping the country. I know he's still a figurehead. I know to a lot of people he's still a hero. Without him, innocent people like that guard at the reservoir wouldn't be killed in bomb outrages. Young men like Sadler wouldn't be sitting in condemned cells waiting to be executed the How day after tomorrow. How has Michael changed? By considering himself to be above the rule of the law. He always taught us that no matter how much 
We disagreed with it. The law was the law and had to be obeyed. That was when other people made the laws, Paul. Now you make them. Are you sure your laws are the good, wise, freely chosen ones he used to talk about? Does it make any difference? It might do. Michael is still a hero, not only to me, but to hundreds of other people throughout the country. Not a great national hero, but an individual. A single person, prepared to speak out against injustice, to champion unpopular causes. Is there anything so wrong in that? No, not if it stops there. Mike didn't stop there. What if you're wrong? I'm not wrong. If? It doesn't make any difference. I shall pull in the whole line within a few days anyway. So that boy needn't die the day after tomorrow? It's not just information that I want. It's realization. It's recognition. I want Mike to admit to me that his action in corrupting that boy's mind, in encouraging terrorism and promoting violence is wrong and that his methods and his words and his actions have led to that boy's death. If he will see that, if he will admit that, then I will stop the execution. The boy need not die if he will just admit his guilt. You don't want cooperation at all. You want a confession. By now, there's no difference. I don't think Father Easton saw anyone else but me. That's what he says, too. Is there any reason why you should suspect him of lying? No. No, no, not at all. But I must have some confirmation. I mean, he must have seen someone. Who opened the door to him when he came? He would have had a key, Mr. Frederick. All our priests have keys. I understand he was working on some proof corrections. Do you know what they were proofs of? Yes, a pamphlet he's written on the English saints. It's one of a series we're doing. Then presumably he had some contact with someone in the printing works. No. You see, we're rather short of space here, and Father Easton used this office to correct his proofs. He usually does. I clear that desk for him over there. Do you leave him in here, or do you stay with him? Oh, it all depends what I have to do. But yesterday I was here the whole time. I had my sermon to prepare for this morning. Father Easton sat there, and I got on with my work over there. So he had no contact with anyone in the printing works either? None at all. Mrs. Blake, my secretary, brought in the proofs to him, and he handed them back to her when he had finished. And never left the room? Never. Where did he go when he'd finished working? To his room, I should imagine, where he still was when your men burst in here yesterday evening. Oh, come in, Doctor. I got your message. I'm glad you could come so quickly. No, it's coming anyway. I uh, hope it isn't anything serious. Come now, it should be obvious. Father Easton picks up a message from Father Conrad, who got it from the girl. Father Easton comes down to London and does exactly what his superior said he did. You know what he said. Where do we go next? If he made contact on the train. No, no, it has to be more organized than that. A priest traveling to and from London on a regular basis, collecting and passing information on every trip. He could quite easily have written out a message on his way down and passed it to someone once he got here. No, no, it's simpler than that. Where did he go when he got to town? went straight to the superior's room where he started correcting proofs. He sat in full view of an independent witness writing a message on the proofs. Isn't it obvious? I'm afraid I don't have the address of the secretary, sir. It doesn't have to be anything to do with her, someone in the printing press. Anyone who had access to those proofs. When we get a sight of the message, we'll know who it was meant for. I'm terribly sorry to turn up like this. Good morning. I hope the Father Superior explained over the telephone. Yes, yes. Would you like to sit down for a minute? Um, Mr. Frederick, is it? Well, we shan't keep you a minute. It was about Father Easton's proofs, wasn't it? Yes, yes. I understand you brought them home yesterday to do some work on them. If I could see them, please. I'm afraid I threw them away, Mr. Frederick. I'm terribly sorry. 
I don't know what Father Easton's going to say, but I was clearing up in here this morning after Mass, and I didn't think. There they were, lying on the floor. And I just bundled them up and put them down the chute. I understand Father Easton was working on the men yesterday. Why, no. It's a terrible thing. I've never done anything like it before. I swear they were still there when you brought me out, Eva. What time was that? About an hour ago, no more. Could you possibly have another look round, Mrs. Blake? Perhaps you would go with a dent. Make sure they're not stuck halfway down the chute. I have checked the chute, sir. Would you like to show me where you threw them down, Mrs. Blake? I'm very sorry to intrude like this, especially on a Sunday, too. Something going on, is there? You the police? No. No, good heavens, no. We're just clearing up a little mystery for Father Easton. May I sit down? Thank you very much. If you ask me, she threw them away on purpose. I don't see how she could have thrown them away by accident. She spent half yesterday afternoon and most of the evening working away at them. You can't work as hard as that on something and then throw it away, can you now? What time did your wife come home yesterday, Mr. Black? Oh, usual time, about half past four. Usual? Does she work staggered eyes? Oh, usual for a Saturday. She works double time to bring a bit extra in, seeing as I can't. But she always comes home at half past four to get me tea. Did she go out again afterwards? No. Did you have any visitors yesterday? No. Not unless you call the doctor a visitor. Oh, the doctor can see you. Oh, he always does on a Saturday. Sometimes twice during the week. Not that he does my back any good. I think he comes to see the wife more than me. Or they spend uh, half an hour out in the kitchen, chatting away, they do. A lot of good that does my back. <clears throat> and did the doctor spend half an hour chatting to your wife yesterday, Mr. Black? Oh, it was more like an hour yesterday. Excuse me. Mrs. Black. Where can I find your doctor? Sir, found these, sir. I was watching him, wasn't I? I saw him get off the bus and walk down the road here. And you've never seen him before? Never. And then I watched him walk beside the water. And then he stopped still and he looked into it. I've seen it happen before. And then he walks right into the water. You see him go under? Yes. And I reckon he took a deep breath when he was under the water. Because he never came up again. Ah, thank you. Johnson. The end of the trail. Yes, sir. Are you certain, absolutely positive, that Professor Donati had no opportunity of communicating with anyone after he left my house last night? Quite certain, sir. Hell. Well, it isn't possible. Hell and damnation. Well, you got Donati and the other, sir. You haven't done too badly. Got a lot of kids, that's all. Some messengers. Nothing of any importance. All right, bring him in. Uh, fetch your car down, will you? How did he know? What's on the other side of that link in the chain that made him kill himself to stop me finding out? Do you want to see him, sir? No. Can't stand death. How did Donati get word to him, Dent? What did he do that I haven't thought of? Perhaps it wasn't Donati, sir. It must have been. There wasn't anyone else. There wasn't anyone else. Dent. Sir? What did you say the name of that doctor was? Dr. Murphy, sir. Murphy. For 
God's sake, why? How's David? David? David who? Dr. Murphy. He's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. That's my fault. I recruited him. You don't know. You do not begin to know the... the appalling destruction. I... I don't mean... innocent people killed and maimed, fire engines sabotaged, destroyed, power stations blown up. I mean, you, you must have calculated that. You must have chosen that. I mean, to your friends. To me. What am I going to do? To save your job. You know, I didn't mean that. Salmon's down there. You know what that means. I've been expecting it for five years. Five years? Since Michael stopped coming. Yes, of course. He was trying to protect me. We knew you'd be watching him. Everybody seems to have been trying to protect you, Jan. What were you trying to do? Undo a little of the damage. I... I don't know. I... I don't begin to understand how you can lose touch with someone you love so completely. You don't know, do you? No. Was it Mike? No, it was you. Just you. You changed. Oh, maybe it was my fault for being ill. But the young man that Michael introduced me to, the boy that was on fire to change the world, to make it better, changed into a cold, hard, ambitious man, making bargains for people's lives, minds, souls. I've never been ambitious, not for myself. For your system. For your cruel word that forces people to be happy, doesn't allow them to be poor or dirty or any of the things that keep people human. Ten years ago, you would never have approved putting tranquilizers in the drinking water. There are no tranquilizers in the drinking water. But there were, weren't there? When you used to get depressed, Murphy gave you TCH to help you over it. Well, we tried putting something like TCH into one reservoir to see if it would help people enjoy life more. The experiment didn't happen to work, so we abandoned it, and that's all. Good for Sadler. What's going to happen to him now? He will be shot the day after tomorrow. Don't imagine that I can save him now. Do you want to? Of course I want to. I hate the necessity of putting that boy, of putting anyone to death. I hate the necessity, but I'm not blind. I hate the alternative even more, the loss of life, the anarchy. I remember the first time you told me they were bringing back the death penalty. I didn't believe you. We had to, Jen. I'd just come back from hospital. I think it was that year when I was away that you changed most. It was as though I were your only hold on humanity and losing me had left you alone with a monster that till then you'd always kept at bay. The world is better. I have changed. For three years after that, I tried to reach you again to make you listen. Did you refuse to listen because I was echoing what was going on in your heart? Did you know what you were doing was wrong? One day, Michael came here to beg you to intervene for some wretched boy who'd been sent to prison for life. You weren't here. I, I asked him what to do. He sat in that chair for a long time. Didn't say a word. And then he asked me if I really wanted to help. I'd lost any hope of saving you, darling. I said yes. A week later, he came back with a whole system of communication set up. The priests... What's happened to them? They've been arrested. The church is closed. We never thought it would last this long. It was after that that Michael stopped coming to visit us. To protect you? Yes. It wasn't me that changed. Oh, but it was. You've never found it easy to love, have you? Except you, no. It is not possible to run a country without loving people, Paul. Really loving them. What am I gonna, going to do without you? And what's going to happen to me? There are mitigating circumstances, you have. You are sick, lonely, corrupted by the malign influence of a public figure. Oh, Michael's not that! Isn't he? Look, you have to choose. There isn't much time. If, if, you, will, if you will help me, if you will cooperate, if you will help me clear up this mess, we, we can make sure that you don't suffer. You'll have to spend some time in hospital, then at a rehabilitation centre. Eventually, you'll be able to come back here. Betray my friends. To serve your country, yes! 
Shaw said that he hoped, given the choice between betraying his friends and betraying his country, he would have the courage to betray his country. Shaw was a socialist who sent his chauffeur out his Rolls Royce to buy his vegetarian foods. Oh, yes, I remember Michael telling us that. Did it matter? He also taught us that what we do must be good in its end, not only good in its result. Do you imagine the havoc you've created is good? No. But I know that what I've done is right. Violence for political ends is never right. With certain conditions, it is not only right, but honourable to use violence for the purpose of restoring freedom. The alternative is prison. A public trial. Possibly a life sentence. Even today, prisons are terrible places. I would like to save you from that, but there isn't much time you have to choose. David gave me these. I don't want them. I don't intend to take the easy way out. Look. I think what you've done is wrong. I think you have been misguided. Foolish. I don't think you realize, as others do, the seriousness of the consequences. I don't want you to suffer. You've made others suffer. The logic now is that I should suffer too. It could destroy you. Not as surely as you've been destroyed. Let me ask Sandman to get that ambulance. You'd hate me if I said yes. I would hate myself if you didn't. Wait, Sandman. Can't you see it now? Your system leaves you no human alternative. You must either hate me or yourself. Isn't that the intolerable choice? It's not of my making. There is one other way. I'll spare you having to destroy me if you let me keep my dignity a little. I don't mind seeming to be a traitor to my friends, and I can bear the humiliation of appearing to be a collaborator if I know that the work is going on. The movement needs the information I've been providing. You could supply it instead. I could get a message through. No one would ever suspect you. Betray what I've lived for. Perhaps. You used to say you lived for me. I'm serious, Paul. I'll tell you everything, I, everything I'm at liberty to tell you. My trial is likely to destroy you too. You must know that. I'll spare you all of that. If you'll take over from me, then I'll let you call your ambulance. Come in, Salmon. Ha, 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 ha,